New York State has just enacted the largest overhaul to its landlord-tenant laws in the last 50 years. In this video, I'm going to go through some of the major changes and how they impact real estate investors. If you're a current landlord in New York or you're thinking about becoming a landlord in New York, you're going to want to check this out. Hey guys, my name is Vitaly Volpov. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a practicing attorney, an active real estate investor, and a part owner of a real estate brokerage in Albany, New York. On this channel, I discuss relevant legal concepts as well as best strategies and tips for real estate investing. Now, Before I jump into the topic of this video, I do have to give a disclaimer. Although I am an attorney, nothing that I say in this video should be construed as legal advice. I provide this information for educational and entertainment purposes only, and you should always consult a qualified attorney in your area before making any legal or financial decisions. Last but not least, the views I express in this video are my own alone, and do not necessarily reflect those of my law firm or any of my business partners. So now that I got that out of the way, let's talk about the new law. On June 14, 2019, Governor Cuomo signed into law the Statewide Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019. This was a 74-page piece of legislation that enacted major changes to the New York State landlord and tenant laws. Now, some of the changes apply only to New York City, and I'm not going to cover them in much detail in this video. If you guys are interested in those changes, please let me know in the comments down below, and I'll plan to make a separate video on this topic at a later date. But for now, I'm just going to focus on the changes that apply to the entire state. Leading up to the enactment of the new law, there was a lot of media coverage relating to the proposal to expand rent regulation to the entire state. If you're not familiar, rent regulation places limits on how much a landlord can charge in rent and by how much a landlord can increase rent from one lease period to the next. Previously, rent regulation applied only to New York City and three nearby counties. However, under the new law, the possibility now exists that rent regulation would be applied to the entire state. The reason I say possibility is because the new law does not actually mandate that any municipality impose rent regulation within its borders. Rather, it gives municipalities the option to do so if certain specific conditions are met. Those conditions are number one, there must first exist a housing emergency before a municipality can impose rent regulation. Housing emergency is defined as a vacancy rate of 5% or less in the housing class of that municipality. Number two, even if a housing emergency is found to exist, rent regulation would only apply to buildings of six units or larger that were built before 1975. Now, in my opinion, most landlords outside of New York City are not likely to be impacted by rent regulation because most landlords invest in municipalities where vacancy rates are greater than 5%. Similarly, most landlords invest in buildings that are fewer than six units. This is true for both myself and my business partner. Although we have a fairly substantial rental portfolio of almost 200 units combined, very few of those units are located in buildings of six units or more. Additionally, in the capital region where we invest, there has been an influx of multifamily housing which has outpaced population growth. So I'm not expecting to see vacancy rates of fewer than 5% anytime soon. In my opinion, the real and immediate concerns with the new law have to do with the other changes, specifically the changes to the eviction procedures. It used to be that a landlord could evict the tenant within 30 to 45 days from the date of non-payment. However, under the new law, those time frames have now been extended to somewhere between 60 to 90 days. Let's look at a hypothetical eviction scenario under the old law and the new law so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Alright, so behind me I have two hypothetical eviction scenarios. One under the old procedures and one under the new procedures. For our purposes, we're going to assume that the court in this municipality hears landlord and tenant cases once a week on a Friday every week. Some municipalities hold them more frequently and some hold them less frequently. But for our purposes, let's just assume that it's once every Friday. So let's take a look at the timelines involved with the first scenario. The rent is due on the first of the month, and if a tenant does not pay rent by the first of the month, on the second of the month, the landlord can provide the tenant with a three-day notice requiring the tenant to pay the rent in full or vacate the property by the fifth of the month. In our case, the tenant does not pay the rent in full and does not vacate the property by the fifth of the month. So the landlord's next step is to proceed to eviction. He would do so by having a process server serve the tenant with the eviction papers and by filing them with the court. Now because of the personal delivery requirement in New York, service of process could take as long as three business days. In this case, that takes us to July 10th. 
Now at this point, the landlord has to determine when the landlord can bring the tenant into court. Under the previous rules, the court date had to be no fewer than five days and no more than 12 days from the date of service. So since our service date in this case is July 10th, the next available court date would be July 19th. So let's assume that on this date, both the landlord and the tenant show up to court and the tenant asks the judge for an adjournment. The tenant could say that they need additional time to come up with the money to pay the landlord or that they need more time to find an attorney to help represent them in the eviction. In either case, the judge would typically grant them their request and adjourn the proceeding to the next available court date. Since in our case, the next court date is the following Friday, it's likely that the judge would push it off to the following Friday. Now let's assume that on July 26th, the tenant either doesn't show up to court or shows up and doesn't have any valid defenses and the landlord wins the eviction. What would happen next is the judge would issue a warrant of eviction to the landlord, which the landlord could then provide to the local sheriff or city marshal for execution. The local city sheriff or marshal would then serve the tenant on the next available date with the warrant of eviction, and under the previous rules, the tenant would have 72 hours to vacate the property. In our case, that would take us out to August 1st, at which point the tenant would either be out voluntarily or they would be removed by the sheriff. So as you can see, under the old rules, the entire eviction process could take as few as 30 days. Now, of course, there are other considerations and other reasons why an eviction process could be delayed. The landlord could fail to provide the notice right away or other delays could come into play. Perhaps the sheriff is backlogged and is unable to serve the tenant with the warrant for several weeks. All those things are possible and could happen, but for our purposes, let's just assume that this is how this eviction went down because those same factors will apply under the new rules as well. So let's look at a hypothetical eviction scenario under the new rules. We still have the rent due on the first of the month, the tenant still doesn't pay, and we also have the court meeting every Friday once a week. So under the new rules, the first thing that has to happen, there has to be a five day waiting period before a landlord can do anything. The next thing that has to happen is the landlord now has to mail by certified mail a notice to the tenant letting them know that the rent is now late. If the landlord does that, the next thing that they have to do is serve the tenant with a 14-day notice. This used to be the three-day notice under the old rules, which now is the 14-day notice. In addition, while you could just give the tenant a three-day notice previously as a landlord, now you have to use a process server and an independent third party to serve the tenant with the 14-day notice. This, of course, could take an additional three business days to complete. And in our case, that gets completed on the 10th, July 10th, and then the landlord has to wait 14 days until July 24th before they can do anything else. Assuming that the tenant doesn't pay by July 24th, the very next thing that the landlord has to do is begin the service of the eviction papers. As in the example before, the landlord again has to use a process server to serve the eviction papers, and because there's a weekend in between, the service of process is actually going to take five days instead of three. In this case, service of process gets completed on July 29th. From there, the landlord has to figure out when they can bring the tenant into court. Now, it used to be under the old rules that you had between 5 and 12 days to do that. Now, that has been extended to between 10 and 17 days. So, doing the math, the next available court date becomes August 9th, and let's assume that they both show up to court on August 9th, and the tenant, as in the previous example, requests an adjournment from the judge. Under the old rules, it used to be within the judge's discretion of whether or not to provide the tenant with an adjournment. Under the new rules, the judge no longer has any discretion and actually has to grant at least a 14 day long adjournment to the tenant. This would take us to the second court date, which would be on August 23rd. And let's assume as in the previous example that both the landlord and tenant show up or the tenant does not show up and in the end the landlord wins the eviction. At that point, the judge would issue a warrant of eviction and give it to the landlord, and the landlord could then give it to the local city sheriff or city marshal. At that point, the city marshal or sheriff would serve the tenant with the warrant of eviction, and the landlord would now have an additional 14 days from the date of service by which they would have to move out. Under the previous law, it was 72 hours, whereas under the new law, it now is an additional 14 days. So comparing the scenario under the old procedures to the scenario under the new procedures, you're looking at approximately an additional 40 day delay between the time that the tenant failed to pay rent to the time that the tenant was actually moved out of the property. So you can see why I'm saying that these changes are much more impactful for most landlords than the possibility of rent regulation, especially if rent regulation is not very likely in their municipality. 
With these new changes, you're looking at additional two months of lost rent, plus additional costs of service of process and certified mail service. All these things add up and all these things end up costing landlords significantly more than they did under the previous rules. I want to take a moment right now and say that if you guys are enjoying this video, if you're getting good value from it, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel. And if you do, hit the notification bell so that YouTube notifies you of all my future uploads. One more note about evictions. Under the new law, a judge can order a discretionary stay of a warrant of eviction for up to a full year if a tenant can show good cause. Previously, this used to be limited to just six months. Under the new law, a tenant can now obtain a stay of a warrant of eviction if they can show that they've been unable to secure similar premises in the neighborhood despite reasonable efforts to do so. Additionally, a tenant can obtain a stay of a warrant of eviction if they can show extreme hardship. Examples of extreme hardship include serious illness, a child's enrollment in school, and any other extenuating life circumstances which may prevent the tenant or the tenant's family from relocating and maintaining quality of life. Now, to be fair, this is supposed to be balanced by the hardship to the landlord resulting from any stay. However, what this really comes down to at the end of the day is, does the judge feel more sympathetic toward you or does the judge feel more sympathetic toward the tenant? The only thing you can do about that is make sure that you're following all the deadlines and the court's rules, you're being respectful to the court, and that the court believes that you're proceeding in good faith. If you can do that, your chances of winning a discretionary balancing test are going to be that much higher. So on to the other changes. Under the new law, the maximum late fee a landlord can charge a tenant is $50 or 5% of the monthly rent. Additionally, landlords are now prohibited from charging application fees. Landlords can still charge a background or a credit check fee as long as that fee is either $20 or the actual cost of the landlord, whichever is less. The new law also imposes substantially longer notice requirements any time that a landlord decides to not renew a tenant's current lease or decides to increase the current rent by 5% or more. Those notice requirements range from 30 days to 90 days, depending on the length of time that the tenant has been in the property and the length of the current lease. The last change that I'll mention is the change that prohibits landlords from denying someone an apartment for rent based on the prior eviction. Violations of this new provision now subject landlords to civil penalties of $500 to $1,000 per violation. Additionally, courts in the state are now prohibited from providing any eviction information to third-party servicers. This means that when you go to do a background check on a tenant, you're not going to see any prior evictions on that report, even if that tenant has prior evictions. With all these changes, there's really no way to sugarcoat it. Being a landlord in New York just became a lot more expensive. Does this mean that you should sell all your properties and move out of state? Well, in my opinion, no, at least not yet. I still think that there's room to adapt and work with the new rules. I also think that good real estate opportunities still exist in New York, especially upstate. One thing that all rental property investors should do, and this has always been true, is to be very selective about the properties they purchase. This new law drives the point home even further. When buying real estate, you need to account for all of the expenses and need to leave yourself with enough of a profit margin to cover anything unexpected. If this new law is going to wipe out your entire profit margin on your rental properties, then you probably should not have bought those properties in the first place. I'm a firm believer that regardless of what changes occur to the landlord-tenant laws, you can still make a healthy profit on rentals if you buy them correctly. When it comes to screening tenants, you have to be more diligent and more creative than you were before. Yes, prior evictions are now off limits, but you still have other criteria that you can use. For example, you can still use credit scores to weed out bad tenants. Yes, you'll miss out on some good tenants with bad credit scores, but it's a lot less likely that a bad tenant will have a good credit score than the other way around. And the point is you want to make sure you're using the available means to screen tenants and avoid bad situations. Additionally, you also may want to consider checking landlord references. And I don't mean just the current landlord. I'm talking about landlords from two, three, or four years ago. Those people will have a lot less incentive to lie to you and tell you that this is a great tenant than the current landlord, who may have a problem on their hands and may be looking to get rid of a problem tenant. So make sure you make the phone calls or have someone on your team make the phone calls to learn that information about that tenant. Finally, you also want to make sure that your tenants are able to afford the rent that you're looking to charge. My rule of thumb is that a tenant has to make gross per month at least three times the monthly rent. 
Otherwise, it's too close of a margin. They're not going to be able to make their ends meet and still pay the rent, and it's just going to be a bad situation. And if you're facing a really expensive eviction, you may also want to consider the cash for keys strategy. This is where you pay a tenant some amount of money to leave the apartment now instead of going through the full eviction, paying all the fees and waiting two or three months. The idea behind this strategy is that you're going to save money because you're going to lose less money by paying the tenant now versus what you're going to pay if you go through the entire eviction process. A lot of landlords don't like this strategy. This is definitely a controversial topic, but in my opinion, it's really a no-brainer. You have to separate your emotions from the situation at hand and look at it from a purely economical standpoint. If it's going to save you three or four thousand dollars to pay this tenant a thousand dollars now to vacate the property, it's really a no-brainer and you should probably do it. Last but not least, you also want to make sure that you're staying on top of all the rules and all the new requirements. The best way to do that is to work with a qualified eviction attorney in your area. Someone who knows the laws in and out and knows the local courts. I'm not saying this because I am an attorney and I want to make my fellow attorneys money. I really think that this new law is a minefield for landlords who don't know the rules. And if you don't know the rules, you want to make sure that you at least are working with someone who does. If you make one mistake, if you make a misstep, you're going to end up costing yourself thousands of dollars. So why not avoid that and pay an attorney up front? It's going to be money well spent and you're going to be better for it in the end. So that's going to do it for this video. I wasn't able to cover all the changes under the new law, but if you guys are interested in learning more, go to my website, SucceedREI.com. I have a detailed article there where you can learn more about it. Also, if you have any questions, Drop a comment for me down below. I'll try to answer as many of them as I can. I'm also curious to see what you guys think about the law. Are you concerned? Are you rethinking your strategy about investing in New York? Or is it just business as usual? If you haven't done it already, hit the like button. If you like this type of content, consider subscribing, hitting the notification bell. I do have a lot more videos and topics on real estate investing on the way, so definitely check those out. But for now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.